Thank you very much, uh, Bjorn, um, and to Goed for inviting me to give this talk, and to Art, who preceded me and, uh, and gave a, a very nice chronological story about the history of the discovery of omega-3s in particular. In fact, my mandate is to talk about aging uh, and omega-3 fatty acids, and the, the history of that topic is actually relatively short. So what I'd like to do is to um, try to integrate some of the talks that have been given by Susan Carlson, for instance, and by Art, um, and by Dr. Wilkinson earlier, uh, and, and try and establish uh, the reason behind the question in the title, and that is, why is this subject rather complicated? I want to just come back to what Susan was talking about and, and say, why did it take us so long to actually figure out that DHA really should be in infant formulas. To some people from the time that Gene Anderson was involved in Michael Crawford, Claudio Galli, uh, Nick Bazan, uh, these were uh, pillars in this field. Uh, it was obvious that DHA needed to be there. It was there from the time of our evolution, as Michael would say, as a species more than two million years ago. And um, it was obviously present in large amounts in the brain, and it was in present in milk. So it, 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 the essential reasons were, were sort of intrinsically present. But it's harder to prove uh, that that's the case. And one of the reasons that it's hard to prove both scientifically and ethically is because most nutrients, as, as Art so brilliantly described, when we study what they do, we try to take them out of the diet and then show how much is needed when you put them back in. And when we come to human nutrition, that's pretty hard to do with nutrients that affect the brain. So it's actually very hard to manipulate the levels of DHA in the brain. And for that reason, it's hard to demonstrate, in fact, what DHA is doing. It, it makes it a tough challenge. And part of that is because, as the, two point, the second point makes, the DHA is present in breast milk. Whether you're consuming very much or not, there's more present when you consume more. But I believe it's true that there are, are no cases of breast milk in humans that actually don't contain DHA. So it's present when the infant is being fed under normal natural conditions. It's present in the body fat of the baby. There's about five to 600 uh, uh, milligrams of DHA on board in the infant when it's born. So that's a second source. And the third source is that it can make some DHA. So there's redundancy. And that makes depleting it very hard, both ethically and scientifically. And that's led to some of the challenges that Susan described and that still confront the field now. And should there still be DHA in formulas? And should we take out arachidonic and all this sort of business? It's because the system has redundancy. It has a form of insurance, which is a term I'm going to come back to. So if we take this model of the challenge facing human brain development and then apply it to the older brain, can we, we can start by asking, is DHA important once, once we age, or is it only really important uh, when, when we're born or, or in early infancy? So what, what do you think? I mean, you, you represent the industry for most of you. Do you think that it matters whether we consume DHA as adults? I heard one yes. I would expect everyone to be hands up. And so I would agree. And I would agree that the answer is probably. But there's, there's some challenges. Because as scientists, we've got to get beyond probably. We've got to be able to convince the regulatory agencies that there's enough meat on this story to give you permission to start advertising it, and that's been part of the challenge. So at this point, we can say probably, but that's not convincing enough. <coughs> if I can make this thing work. So it's hard to manipulate brain DHA in infants, ethically, but also scientifically. What can we do about DHA measurements in adults? So this is a study that came from Stanley Rapport's lab, published about five years ago. It's the only study involving imaging DHA intake with a PET tracer, not intake, but, but uptake by the brain with a PET tracer. So that 
an anatomical image of the brain is on the left and a PET image is on the right. And, and as the color goes towards the red end of the spectrum, that's where the DHA is taken up in the brain and that represents the cortex, the gray matter of the brain, the thin layer that does all the heavy lifting, if you will. But they concluded, as the title to the slide says, that it takes about 900 days to change all the DHA in the brain. In other words, once it gets in there, it stays around for a long time. Or does it? So 900 days sounds like an awfully long time, but, but 90 days, let's say, that means you should be able to change 10% of the DHA in the brain within 90 days. If it takes 900 days to change 100%, then you could extrapolate and say, well, after 90 days, that's only three months. Could we really change DHA in the brain by 10%? in three months if we didn't consume it? That's a challenge in itself, is to just not, not being able to consume any at all. And so it comes to the question of what is the composition of DHA in the brain? And this is a summary slide that we published uh, on a couple of occasions, but the, the Progress in Lipid Research uh, paper actually describes these values. And these colored bars represent a little bit of the history of research on DHA in Alzheimer's disease. And the white bar at the bottom is also the two, the two white bars are from Soderberg's group. I haven't given you the details, but I'd be happy to share the details of these publications with you if anyone's interested to follow up. Soderberg was one of the first to actually make these measurements. And interestingly, in people, so these are brain DHA levels in people dying who have a, 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 a diagnosis of, of Alzheimer's disease. And interestingly, he found, in fact, the, the greatest deficit of DHA compared to the other studies. So if the healthy controls that were matched to these Alzheimer's patients are on the red bar, call it 100%, that's the normal value, if you will, then values around 50 to 60% are clearly much lower. And this stood alone uh, as the only study on DHA in Alzheimer's disease for I can't remember exactly how long, but at least 10, maybe 15 years. But the other colored bars have been published since then. And as you can see, in fact, Soderberg, I should have checked to be sure, but the number of patients is on the order of probably 20. The total number in the title here is over 200. So there have been a number of studies. And what you can see is that a lot of the values cluster around the 100% bar. And that suggests that, in fact, people can die with Alzheimer's disease with totally normal DHA in the brain. So some studies see a difference, but many studies don't see a difference. Now, that might depend on where you measure it. It might depend on how long they've had the disease. It might depend on many things. But it adds to the challenge of establishing in these individuals, are they DHA deficient in the place that seems to matter the most? In, in, in the aging body, and that's in the brain. So, is it hard to manipulate DHA in adults, brain DHA? Yeah, it is. It might not be uh, unimportant. It might be important to be able to manipulate it, but it's hard to show that we can actually change it in people who are uh, really struggling uh, cognitively, if you will. So, we can back off the brain and say, well, what do we know about intakes? And Adam gave us a nice presentation, a nice survey of this, and Susan followed it up. I think Adam said that, what was it? 80% of the world is consuming less than 500 milligrams a day of DHA. Was that the number, approximately? And Susan said that most Americans, or child, women of childbearing age, I should say, in, in the USA, were consuming 53 milligrams per day. So the question should be, obviously, no, we're not consuming enough. Well, this is a graph that doesn't have much information except to say that you can relate dietary DHA intakes to plasma DHA levels. And, and this is drawn from a number of different uh, publications because it's actually difficult to measure all the foods that might have some DHA and it's difficult to get a really good number. Susan was doing 24-hour recalls. Well, you might not have eaten any fish yesterday, so and this should counterbalance with a number of different people in the study. But it becomes difficult to do really good dietary intake work 
And if plasma values in, in are a good uh, surrogate for, for DHA intake, then, and this relationship is actually quite strong, then we should be able to measure this and get a good idea of your average intake from your plasma values. The trouble is, as you get older, the, bar, the, the, the graph gets pushed over to the left in the sense that for a given intake of 150 milligrams, you actually have more DHA in the blood than you should have in, in parentheses. Or for the same actual value in the, in the plasma, you actually have lower intake than we would have calculated if we were using the average value for younger adults. So aging affects the amount of DHA in the plasma irrespective of the amount you eat. And the same is true if you carry the apolipoprotein E4 allele of that uh, particular protein, which is a, a significant um, risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. People who carry that particular allele of APOE have more DHA in their blood than they should have. So if this works, so in a sense, physiologically I mean, older people trick us into thinking that they have more DHA than they actually do. So plasma is not necessarily a reliable indicator of your intake. And it's hard to measure what's in the brain. We have to wait till you've died for one thing. How annoying. So we don't really know um, if we're consuming enough, but we suspect that most people aren't, both from the large-scale uh, mapping of this information and from these physiological measurements. So what's the other part of the story that, that comes to play? Like in the infant, infants store about 500 milligrams when they're born, if they're born at term. That's pretty handy as a reserve. Are we storing a lot of DHA as adults? We certainly have, most of us, the fat reserves that you would think so. Are we making enough DHA? And in both cases, I'm going to cut the, sh the, the answer or the, the, the substance of the answer quite short because I want to, to go on. But in fact, the answer to both of those, here we go, got too excited. The answer to both of those is, is, a, is a resounding no, and I'd be happy to defend that during the question period. We're not making much DHA. It's very difficult for us to make DHA. We should be consuming it, um, and, and we're not storing that much, partly because we're not eating uh, uh, enough. So another aspect to this is how do we identify people that might need DHA supplementation to protect them as they age, whether it's cardiovascular, risk factors or whether it's cognitive risk factors. What do we do to identify these individuals? That's, this is the age of personalized medicine after all. So how do we do that? I've taken uh, here a, a graph to show you work that we're doing right now with uh, carbon-13 labeled DHA. It's a stable isotope tracer. I got these results on Monday um, from my, uh, one of my students. We've only got four Alzheimer's patients on this graph, and it, so the healthy older controls are separated by whether they carry the APOE4 allele or not because of its risk factor significance. There's 34 individuals on the red bar, the red graph, so that represents, let's call it the ideal situation. And you can see that the blue, gra the blue uh, bars and our, our graph uh, lines are showing for fewer people that if you carry APOE4 positive, you have lower DHA transfer through the blood over a seven, um, a seven day period. Uh, sorry, uh, a 28 day period. This is seven days out here. So this is a long period of time that we've collected information on the behavior of this tracer in the blood. And if you've got Alzheimer's disease, you get a little bit of a, a surge at the beginning within the first few hours, and then your curve goes down. So what? What do we know because of this? This isn't one blood sample. This isn't two blood samples. This is eight or nine blood samples over a month-long period. And all we know, actually, is that the values for Alzheimer's disease are lower. 
Does that mean they didn't absorb as much? Or does that mean it actually went into the tissues where it's supposed to be going faster than in the healthy elderly? And the answer is I don't know. Because, and so it's hard to interpret. And this, this tool, this stabilized isotope tracer approach is actually quite expensive. It's not that easy to access uh, this type of tracer even if money wasn't an issue. It's helping us learn something new, but in fact it's creating other questions as well. So I think the short answer to the question, do we know how to identify people that need DHA supplementation is not very well yet. So we've got a lot of work to do on that as well. And then there's the issues of what changes with aging anyway. We don't age at the same rate. We have different lifestyles, different physical activity, different genetic backgrounds. We've got comorbidities. And DHA is a factor uh, in some of those as well, or is influenced by those conditions. So there's a bunch of confounders that affect our need for DHA as we get older. As Susan mentioned, and um, I think is, is probably obvious to most of you, DHA supplementation trials, whether in the older population or in the infant, are open to interpretation. Is the glass half empty or is it half full? And some people see a silver lining in results that are statistically not very impressive and some people say, you know what, there's nothing happening here. And that's the challenge we face as, as scientists in this field. I think there's another element that comes into play here, and that is that the brain uses a lot of energy. As adults, even more so in children. And this is a PET image of glucose uptake in the form of the PET tracer FDG in controls and in Alzheimer's disease. And the red color represents the normal pattern, and the absence of red suggests that there's much less glucose being taken up, which has been known for 35 or 40 years. Now you might say, well, if the neurons are dead, they're not going to take up glucose. That's pretty obvious, and that's true. But in fact, we see this pattern in people before they get the cognitive symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. So if neurons need a lot of energy to talk to each other, and they need DHA at the interface, at the synapses, if you're given DHA, we've solved half the problem. But maybe if we don't solve the energy problem, they're still not going to be able to send message from one to the other. So maybe it takes something more than DHA to make this work. So what it comes down to for me is, is it really this complicated? Or is there something simple that underlies all these issues? We, we can understand that there's complicated scientific questions, but in the, the bottom line is insurance. Do you want to take a chance? How many of you drive a car without putting your seatbelt on? I'm sure you wouldn't put your hand up if you did. But <laughs> How many of you have got a house that you live in without fire insurance? It's the same thing. It's going to be almost impossible, and it's not a question of the money that's involved, or even the time, to prove that DHA is going to solve Alzheimer's disease, or even for heart disease for that matter, although it's not my, my topic. The question is, do you want to take a chance that you're going to be able to, to get by without it? Are you going to walk across? I guess my time is up. Are you going to walk across the street without checking which way, the, if there's traffic coming? You understand the idea. So it might be very difficult to prove that we need DHA, but is that the point? I think the point is that it's, it's a level of protection that we should be prepared to invest in because it makes sense to be, have that insurance. The baby's born with three ways to get DHA, not breast milk alone, not its fat stores alone, not its ability to make some DHA alone. It's got redundancy. And that's the only way you can protect the DHA to get into the infant's brain. So it's the same analogy. It's going to be very difficult to prove this in, in adults or in the aging brain in Alzheimer's disease with all the confounders, with all the issues that David Wilkinson told us about in relation to, to 
uh, randomized controlled trials in Alzheimer's disease, forget it. We're not going to we're not going to go there. I don't think. But it makes sense to to take a preventive uh, insurance type strategy. Thank you very much for your interest.